to so call this meeting to order of the um, community uh, the community outreach subcommittee. I'm just going to read this statement. Um, and Perry, if you want me to, I can say that this will also cover the full school committee that's going to be called to order in a moment. Um, so this meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to an issue ordered by the governor of Massachusetts dated March 12, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Ingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to attend this meeting, please notify the chair, or sorry, me, at the start of this meeting in accordance with Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that I may inform other participants of said recording. Um, so I know that uh, we are recording the meeting, and I believe Harbor Media is also recording the meeting. And is there anyone else on the call who is recording the meeting? Uh, yes, this is Greg Levine with the Hingham Current. We're recording the meeting. Thank you, Greg. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. Um, I will call the meeting of the full school committee to order at 902. Thank you. All right. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here um, for this fourth coffee with the superintendent, I can't remember how many we've had. Um, they had a really great opportunity, just in an informal way, to um, meet with Dr. Austin, ask questions. Um, we have several of the leadership administrative team on here as well, so I'm sure Dr. Austin will reach out to them if um, there are particular building questions or programming questions. Um, and so uh, the format will be just if you have a question or a comment or an idea, um, you know, you can use the raise hands button. Um, if you click on the participants tab, you will, there should be a raise hand function and I will call on you. If people could try to be mindful that, you know, lots of people may have questions or comments. So if we could kind of try to limit um, questions to two to three minutes um, and then we'll have responses and um, we'll get going. So Dr. Austin, I'll turn it over to you. Well, great. Good morning, everyone. and. Uh... Um, always glad to do these coffee talks, although the last time we did, when I think there were over 500 participants, uh, and so we're a little shy of that this time, it's a little more intimate, uh, which I, I certainly appreciate the ability to, to take the questions that everybody has for us. Uh, if you don't mind, I've got a, a quick just kind of thing that I'm going to um, just read off for myself. I've got my own notes here that uh, we'll start with just a, just a couple of minutes of quick statement to kind of bring everybody up to speed. So as we approach the end of our seventh week of the school year, now fifth week of hybrid learning, I want to take this opportunity to express my sincere appreciation for the collaborative work of our teachers, our administrators, support staff, and families who have worked very hard together to support our students uh, during this challenging time. We appreciate the creativity and diligence of our teachers um, in engaging students through the Learn From Anywhere model, and we fully understand the important roles uh, and sacrifices that families and caregivers have assumed in supporting the students uh, while learning remotely and in the hybrid um, situation we have. Many of you received a public health alert on Monday uh, that followed the governor's announcement of significant restrictions, which certainly underscored the seriousness of this public health crisis to the town of Hingham. We have to understand and respect the threat of COVID-19 on our community and the restrictions that were put in place to mitigate it I know many of you are anxious to have your students back in school, and I know we all share the concern for the health and well being of both our staff and students. These are incredibly challenging times, but I know that every member of Hingham Public Schools is doing the very best they can to serve the children and families of Hingham. Hingham has been in the red uh, for the past three weeks, and as we all know, we're waiting for today's. Um, but we've been in the red for the past three weeks, and that's scary for our teachers for our staff and for our families. We've been able to stay in the hybrid model because our public health team has determined that COVID-19 uh, transmission are happening outside of school buildings. But that can change quickly and we need to be diligent. I am thankful that our protocols and procedures have been effective in mitigating the spread of COVID-19 in our schools. However, all evidence is pointing to a difficult period ahead as we approach the winter months. Yesterday, 
the United States had more than 120,000 positive COVID cases in one day across the country, and Massachusetts had one of its highest days since April with over 1,700. Although the district is doing everything possible to push ahead and consider increased in-person instruction for the youngest students, the road ahead is going to be difficult. There is no easy path forward, but we're ready to take it. We are all suffering from this terrible crisis and at the end of the time that it's dragged on and take, has taken its toll on us. But I have no doubt that we can endure the road ahead if we afford each other grace, space, and compassion. We're all doing our best to manage a crisis like we've never seen before. We can and we will make it through this together. And I want to let you know that I am dedicated to ensuring the district not only comes out of that this, but emerges from the crisis better and stronger than ever before. It's going to take time, but I have no doubt we will get there. To get you up to speed on the actions I've taken to manage the COVID metrics, I share the following. Each week, I meet with our district's COVID task force, consisting of building principals, board of health, our school physician, president of the Hingham Education Association, AP, uh, HPS nurse manager, and town nurse to discuss the COVID-19 protocols, recent cases in the district or town, and we analyze the data for trends and patterns. In an effort to provide full uh, uh, transparency to the community, we post weekly data and updated health metrics under the district communications tab on our district reopening page. Data provide, uh, provided includes a breakdown of the number of positive cases in town, the designated map color as determined by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, the cumulative number of cases in Hingham Public Schools, and the test positive rate for Hingham. Inclu and also includes the total number of staff and students in quarantine by school. That data is available to you. We update it every Friday afternoon. Um, I will say the good news is for the past two weeks, we have had uh, a total of two cases, uh, one per week. Um, and so we have, uh, and we also experienced some downturn in the cases of Hingham itself. Although the map has been delayed till today, uh, I am hoping, and I know that nobody knows for sure until we actually see it, but we are hoping that, that Hingham changes from red to yellow uh, today. So that's good news for us, um, but certainly something we need to continue to watch. As I said before, Hingham has been designated as a red zone for the past three weeks due to the number of positive cases for the town. The trend is disconcerting, and we cannot overstate the importance of social distancing, hand washing, and vigilance in our community. While we uh, certainly find that the current data concerning, the Hingham Board of Health, working with contact tracers from the state response team, has analyzed the cases of school-aged children and families, and thus have far have not identified any school-based clusters or established any evidence of school-based spread. While this data is imperfect, the contact tracing provides some indication that our school-based protocols for physical distancing and sanitation are working as intended. Again, we implore our community to stay vigilant as your support is essential to maintaining community health and will be an essential component of our effort to maintain opportunities for in-person learning. In addition to the HPS COVID task force, I'm also a member of the town's incident command COVID task force that meets on a weekly basis. This group consists of the town emergency management director, which is fire chief Steve Murphy, the chief of police, the town administrator and administrator, and the director of Hingham Health Department. This group discusses COVID-19 as a townwide concern and makes decisions to, the best, in, to best ensure the health and safety of all residents. We understand that HBS is just one part of a broader community and these meetings provide important context for me for the data that we analyze. We thank you for your continued support of Hingham Public Schools in this difficult time, and I'm certainly ready to take your questions now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Um, I see we have a couple of questions already. Uh, Lauren Bowes, you're ready to go. Awesome, thanks. Hi, Dr. Sure. Austin, how are you? Good morning, I'm good, how about you? Good, um, thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm a parent of a first grader at South School, so first of all, I just wanna thank Mary Eastwood if she's on for how hard her and her staff are working um, during this time, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, that being said, I'm very concerned, obviously, about the hybrid model and the 
path forward. Um, I know you referenced two school committee meetings ago for January 4th start date for the K through two. Um, based on the cases and where we're trending, um, I'd like to hear from you, number one, is that still the target date? And if so, what does the progress look like? I know there were three options that you and the school committee were discussing on, on how to actually do that. So I'd love to hear an update on that piece. Sure. Um, where we're at right now, that is still the target date. We are looking for after uh, the holiday break. I will say there is some concern about that um, that date in particular because it's directly after a, a significant break where there will be people traveling. Um, and so I, I think, you know, I've certainly heard some, some feedback about that um, just as we come back off the traveling period and a, and a break and then coming back into school. Um, but right now we are still in negotiations with um, the diocese of, um, to um, – to um, solidify our, our contract, hopefully, with um, Weymouth um, or with that with that uh, school in Weymouth. So we are still on that uh, track. We still plan to take that if we can. Um, and that's what that looks like as soon as we can, uh, again, uh, get, a, get an agreement with them. We'll, we'll be doing that. Um, we are working through other things, such as transportation. Um, we continue to work on that. And, and we think that um, we, we have a path forward. but. Um, Again, we're, we're continuing to work on that. And the other part of that is that we have to negotiate these things. There are, these are working conditions. So we'll have to go into negotiations, which we've already done with the association, um, to talk about those things. So those are all part of things that can interrupt that January 4th start, um, because everyone has an interest in this. Um, but we're making progress. That's still the, that's still the target. Um, that's still what we want to do, uh, particularly for K-1-2. Um, and uh, hopefully we... Um, we continue on that path. So that's where we're heading. Um, have you been able to hire bus drivers or change the rules on like meeting it between like one mile or two miles? Has any of that happened? We have not done that route with that. Um, but what we've done, um, we've started to look at our internal process and perhaps getting some buses for us um, because we do have some subs that could do that. So I think we are, we're on the path to be able to provide the transportation, uh, particularly if it's K-1-2 right now, uh, to be able to do that. So. Um, you know, the, the exact program uh, of, or how we're going to do that, um, we haven't exactly um, figured that out completely, but we are making progress. And sorry, last thing, just because I want to clarify something you said to make sure I understand. When you said the association, does that mean you're still negotiating with the teachers union? Is that what that means? Yeah, every time we change anything that in regards to how it impacts the teachers working conditions, we have to negotiate pieces or update the MOU or, or do a new one, whatever one which takes place. Uh, we are negotiating those right now when we've been meeting with them uh, and we're, we're continuing to meet with them. Thanks, appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank you, Lauren. Um, all right, next we have Kim Wittrick. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, sure. Hi, Dr. Austin. I was hoping that you could please explain to parents the changes that you uh, have in the works for remote, fully remote students K through five to remove them from their current classrooms and place them in one district wide remote classroom per grade. Um, as a parent of remote students, I feel like this hasn't been appropriately or transparently communicated that this is in the works. If you could please give uh, details to parents so they can plan, um, I think that would be appreciated. And if you could expand on what that would mean for students, particularly in grades three, four, and five, um, if there is not plans to, to bring everybody back full time for them, why they would have to leave their classroom um, this far into the school year? Uh, and what would happen if students needed to quarantine <laughs> from those grades? Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of questions, and I, I, I would love to give you the opportunity to be transparent and let folks know what's happening. Well, I, I think, you know, first of all, and, you know, in the issue of transparency, it's not like we have all these huge plans out here and we've already come up with a, uh, this is exactly the way it's going to work kind of thing. It, it's a, what we brought to the school committee on the October 19th was an idea that we had about trying to figure out what to do with remote students, because it's just a reality that if we're going to ask teachers to have 15 students in front of them, you know, making sure that we get a quality education to students who are remote. Uh, and it's doable for a teacher become a real real issue for us uh, and a real issue for the, for the teachers and a real issue is to make sure that we get a high quality education for the students who are remote. 
So the thought is the thought process that we discussed as a team was looking at with it when I'm talking about elementary principals, the assistant superintendent, myself, um, and, the, and the director of student services is to look at a model because the reality is in, a, in about each grade, um, there's about 20 to 25 students per grade um, total uh, in each of the grades, whether that's kindergarten, kindergarten's actually quite a bit less. Uh, first and second, uh, third's got a little bit uh, few uh, more students than that. Uh, and so we're looking at, you know, it made up kind of a nice um, size class that could be remote um, and looking at who would do that uh, and how that would be done are all things that are still up in the air and they also have to be negotiated. So it's not even a matter of, you know, we've got this plan, here it is. It also has to be negotiated with the union. How those, so some of the questions that you're asking are things that still are, are left up in the air for, for us to be able to negotiate and to figure out right now. Um, so we're still in the planning stages of that. We want to give you information. We want to give you accurate information of exactly what's going to happen. Um, but our big concern, just to, to kind of what we're, we're dealing with, is the big concern is how to ensure that we provide the best quality education to the students who are remote uh, in, a, in a setting that uh, they get a lot out of. Uh, and so we're concerned about that. Uh, and that's why that's how we're kind of coming at this right now. Um, Dr. Ludilwa, are you on the call right now? Do you want to add anything to that? I don't think he, he may not be in. Yeah. Um, any of the elementary principals, Mary Eastwood, do you want to add anything to that? I'm here. Sorry, I'm here. I'm sorry. I was unmuting. I was unmuting. I apologize. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't mind with you. Um, yeah, I, I think to give context to the discussion, I think if we back up in the initial planning, when we were going into a hybrid, learn from anywhere, where we had cohorts that were present and not present, um, the initial design of the plan did give teachers support for uh, their remote learners. So the, I, the initial design actually assigned each teacher a para or a support person to support uh, remote learning to help the co like the, with the cohort that actually wasn't physically in the building. And as the school year opened, what we found was, and, and Paul, you, Dr. Austin, you would probably know better than I, but we were down 40 to 50 um, positions. And so the idea of giving teachers support um, sort of dissipated and we, we're doing it where we can, but as we uh, move to full in-person learning, particularly for our youngest teachers, as we move from a cohort model and have everybody back learning full time, we needed the teacher, um, you know, where the remote students might be spread out like one to two per section, um, as the kids made a full return, we needed to talk about how they would sort of work with the full class in front of them and then one to two remote students. And we felt as if for our remote learners, it made the most sense uh, to give them their own full-time remote teacher who could be with them uh, more frequently during the day. But, it is, but this plan really was only as we moved to a phase three model so that as the kids come back full-time, we need our teacher's attention to return to the full-time students. But our remote learners, we needed to provide for a level of support and learning that we weren't able to do uh, given our current staffing. So that was sort of part of the background of where the remote, uh, the remote teacher came from. At this stage though, um, where it's not as if it's being executed. I mean, it was a, a proposal we made to the school committee to try to address the full person, the, the push for a full return to in-person learning um, did facilitate us having to be more thoughtful about how, about what we are expecting of our teachers who are struggling uh, on some level with managing multiple cohorts. Now, it's working right now because the entire class is in a hybrid, but as we move to full in-person learning, we're gonna have to be thoughtful of how we support our teachers and working with our remote learners. And that's just a little bit of the background of how we ended up where we did with the conversation. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, thank you, Kim, um, for that question. And there will uh, you know, definitely be more um, information shared and uh, but appreciate you bringing it up um, because it certainly wasn't intentional not to be transparent or not to share that information you know, as everyone on the call can imagine right this situation changes daily um, and unfortunately that does um, sometimes um, happen at the schools as well but appreciate you bringing it up and, um, and we'll be mindful of that to ensure that we're getting information out 
to folks um, as quickly and in real time as we can, because we do understand that people have, um, you know, families have to make arrangements and make plans as well. So thanks for bringing that up. I think the other um, part of that is that just, just so we, so we're also clear that this was just to, to be clarity, because the question was, how does that impact if we're not going to do three to five in full time? You know, does that impact that? And, and you know, I think the quick answer on our thinking of that is, is it doesn't right now because we only do this as it associates with with phase three. Um, so as we move a, a grade in from phase three, that's what we'd be looking at. So if we're going to look at kindergarten per se, we're going to look for, for kindergarten first uh, and, and try to get that um, try to get that set as we move to phase three. Uh, so that would be some of the thinking. But again, we're flushing that out. So uh, do, I do thank you for bringing that up. Um, the next question is Liz Klein. Hi, thank you, Dr. Austin, and to the school committee for hosting this session and, and taking my question. Um, my question is it's somewhat related to the previous two. Um, I know we have, or a plan has been communicated for grades K through two. Um, so just wondering when we can expect a plan for grades three through 12 to go back. Yeah, I think, you know, I don't have an answer for that, Liz, right now, um, you know, other than because, as Michelle said, I, and I think, you know, it, it's absolutely true, things are changing on a daily basis. Um, you know, our focus uh, has been on K-2 um, right now and, and really even kindergarten, um, just to, to try to get to kindergarten right now um, is, is my top focus, um, and, and uh, so I, I just don't have an answer for that. Um, of, of when you can expect another plan. Um, it really depends on, you know, what direction the COVID takes in our community, um, how quickly we can get an agreement with uh, the association on um, the move to uh, full in-person learning, how quickly I can get staff um, that I need because we're gonna have to have higher staff. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot of pieces into that. Um, but I think we're all dedicated to certainly looking at the elementary level I, I would say it's getting, um, you know, we haven't had a lot of conversation about 6 to 12 um, because those are much larger buildings, uh, many more uh, people in them. Uh, and so we have not focused on that at this time and had any real discussion about uh, 6 to 12 where we're simply focused right now on K-5. Okay. Um, is it, can we assume that the budget that is being put forth will include K through 12 in the classroom. So meaning the budget that we're putting, you know, for, for the next school year assumes everybody's in the building, all the staff, everything we need. I, I'm hoping the budget is kind of a, a complete wish list, if you will, right. of, of getting every single student back. Because I think parents, I, you know, I have children in sixth and eighth grade. I need to know what September looks like at this point to make plans. For, for yeah. what's going to happen Liz, next year? Liz, I can tell you, I certainly hope so. Um, yes, the budget will be for that. It'll be, I mean, I, I think what you can expect during this budget cycle, and we've already had a lot of conversation about this, is not only to get us in full time, but also to remediate um, the loss of instruction uh, for those students that have really struggled during this time, particularly, um, to, to look at special education um, and to really build a very robust budget um, moving forward to, to prepare us for, as I said at the beginning, not only just to return, because I don't think we should return to what we were, we need to return to what we want to become and what, what we need. Um, and so that's the budget we put forward. I also want to say, because I've been, I've been accused before of saying that I've taken, you know, six to 12 completely off the, off the table for the year. That is not accurate. I don't want to say that, but I want to say that we're focused on K-5 and everything is, is still kind of relevant as far as what we have for spread of the disease um, and what course it takes. Everything can change. And like everybody else, I'm really hoping that the winter is not as bad, that we find some, some way to treat this. We find a way to either a vaccine and that hopefully by the end of the year we're back in. Um, I would love to have that happen if I can do that safely. Uh, I certainly would want to make that happen. So I do respect you know, that people want to make their plans for September. And so do I, um, but I think if we were sitting back here last March, um, who would have ever thought that this September we'd be uh, in a hybrid uh, learning program because we thought we'd have this done in a matter of weeks, uh, and if not weeks, months. 
uh, and here we are going on one year. Uh, and so, you know, that's all of our hope that we get back to um, programming and, and that we have the ability to bring all of our students in uh, pre-K through 12 in September and maybe earlier. Great. Thank you. And, and just to reiterate, I know Susie O'Horas said this the other night, I mean, there, there are hundreds, hundreds of families that are willing to fight for this budget and, and want, you know, not even what we had on March 12th. We want more for the students and we know that that takes money. <laughs> so, um, you know, certainly call on us to help. Um, so thank you. Not only going to call on you, I'm going to hopefully you're there, Liz, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to be truthful, with everybody, and the idea of transparency, it's going to be a tough budget year. So you're absolutely right. Uh, and when I say tough budget year, it means revenue-wise. You know, all the, the, the revenue we've received for the state is really up in the air. There's no visibility of that at all right now. Um, you know, the Commonwealth is struggling with loss of revenue itself uh, and how that plays out on what it can support in education. Um, which means that the less money we have coming from the state side means more money has to come from the town side. I know that people are out there supporting that, and I greatly appreciate that. I'm going to do my best to, to build a budget of, of the things that we need um, and, and move forward with that. So I hear you, and uh, I appreciate the support. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, all right, the next question is from Andrew McElhaney. Hi, thank you, Dr. Austin. Um, so you cited a lot of facts and figures about the COVID pandemic, and obviously everything is hyper-local in terms of the decision-making. So I think one thing that's hard for me, and I think other people in this community, is to look at a hyper-local level and see other private parochial schools back full-time, and a lot of the fears that we had haven't manifested themselves in, in their model yet. So I was hoping that you could articulate some of the different challenges maybe that Hingham faces that they are either not or have overcome in some other manner. Yeah, I, you know, Andrew, I, I don't really know. I don't study the other districts. I can tell you what South Shore is struggling. I mean, I, yesterday the, the entire region looked at, you know, who's going to even consider more in person. There are many districts on the South Shore who are not bringing in high need students uh, full time, which we are. Um, we're not only doing that, we're, we have several levels of students that are coming in five days a week. Um, and, and the majority of, um, in fact, there wasn't another district, uh, and Dr. LaVilla and I spoke about this yesterday, there is not another district that answered that uh, on the South Shore that's considering bringing more students in. We're the only ones that are. And so I can compare myself to South Shore and what other districts are dealing with. I think the reality is that we're dealing with a, you know, I, I, mean, I mean, it's just a reality of perception. Whether we talk about hyperlocal or not, you have a governor that came on the news last week and told us that we can't have Thanksgiving with our neighbors or, or our families, or we can't have anybody here come um, to have more than a couple of people in your house that aren't your household. And yet at the same time, we're talking about bringing more students into school is a difficult sell to a lot of people that are in those schools. Uh, and I respect that uh, 100%. The fact is that we have not had any spread um, uh, of the schools, I agree. And, and I think that Michelle Ayer asked me a question at the school committee the other night of if we had, because we talk about quarantine numbers and we average probably high 70s, uh, 80s uh, in quarantine on a regular basis. If we had, when we have cases, and again, the last two weeks, I'm not sure what's happening, why we're down to one, because towns around us are exploding again um, on the in-school side. So we're on a lull for whatever reason. But when we have one student um, or uh, that's been in a school, that becomes infected, right now there are no close contacts because they're not in six feet to each other. As soon as I move in to three feet, that moves from zero to four, um, being out on top of the, the student that would be out. Um, so we exponentially, you know, challenge ourselves to say, this is gonna be four times the people, you know, if you have two cases in a school, you're gonna have eight people out minimally that would have contact with that. Um, so there are some challenges in that. Um, there are challenges to make sure that um, we are abiding by um, DESI rules, which are three to six feet, right? And, and, and so we know right now we're at six feet. Those are the CDC rules, rules of, of the CDC wants people six feet apart. I would also say there's another change um, that recently happened that it was six feet of what you had to be for close contact. You had to be six feet within six feet for 15 minutes total at one time. Now it's 15 minutes cumulative over a 24-hour period. 
we've yet to see how that's going to impact us uh, overall. But I, I want to be clear that these decisions, I'm, I'm not making in a vacuum, right? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm making those communications. And one of the things that I'm doing, whether it's me or the town manager, the board of health, um, the nursing department, the, the town nurse, um, or the DPH, um, we're making and getting information about when to move forward or when not to. And frankly, most people are really kind of nervous about moving from six feet to three feet. And that's not just our town, that's everywhere. I'm seeing sorry, that. Sorry, Dr. When you say most people, what is that? What's the universe? I'm going to say most staff are really anxious. Most staff are, are very in, um, concerned about when we move past six feet, and including myself. When we move out of the six foot range and we start putting people together uh, and more people in a, in a classroom. And so, who will uh, really make that decision? Is that solely your decision? Is it your No, decision? it'll be something that I bring to the school committee. I'm bringing everything to the school committee. I'll bring my recommendations and after I'll ask for the school committee to, if we choose to bring in um, you know, students uh, and change that, I will bring my recommendation. I'll ask for the, the support of the school committee on top of that. And what can parents be doing to help? One thing I'm thinking of is I know transportation is an issue. And anecdotally, I've spoken to lots of parents who say I'd be willing to drive my own child every single day. So I think there are probably issues that might be solvable that people aren't aware of, that where people in the community can be part of the solution but don't have the opportunity to. So are there other examples where parents can be doing something to be helpful, to be part of the solution? Yeah, I, I think there's two things. And one, I know that transportation is, is out there, and I, I agree with you. I'm not really horribly worried about transportation because I think you're right. I think that if parents will will do that, and there's now I do understand there's waivers too that we could do when we do that. So I'm not horribly worried uh, about transportation. I think that's a doable thing. Um, I, I think there's a couple of things, and the biggest thing that we can do is limit um, our exposure outside of school. We, we, you know, we still see, I, I'm sorry, we still see, and we see it around us. We've been very, very fortunate here. We see it in the towns around us, towns that are closing down because of parties uh, and, and, you know, social gathering. Hockey's going to start up again, which was a big spreader a couple weeks ago. They, they stopped it for two weeks, and we went down in cases. Hockey's starting up again. You know, we, we've got to remain vigilant if we want, if, if the best thing that parents can do is, is uh, do everything we can to mitigate um, the uh, exposure to large groups um, and maintaining the very, very small circle that we're in so that we don't bring the cases in because that's what's going to hurt us more than anything is bringing cases in. Got it. So that's the process, the procedure. Is there a goal so that if everybody limits their exposures, then we get to X number? Like, what's the metric that we're shooting for? I feel like we're all watching this data, watching the metric, and no one knows what the goal line is. No, that, that's a great question because I continue to, this is one thing that the, the, the COVID task force for the town has been looking at, and we're talking about what metrics, were, what we could use. Nobody has, the, you're, you're absolutely correct. There are, no, there are no real metrics anywhere. Now, well, I, I shouldn't say that, right? The town has metrics that, not the town, the state, that basically said if you're red, we're supposed to be remote, right? That was, that was the deal. But then they gave us additional guidance said, well, you're supposed to be remote unless you have, you know, well, and you have increased to the risk of transmission in schools. So the reason we're not red, I mean, the reason why we're not out of a hybrid is because we didn't have the transmission in school, but we were red. Um, and so, but that's the only metric we have. I'm being told, Andrew, that DESE um, and is working with um, the physicians across the state to have a different metrics um, for us and, and create a new metrics, but that's something we're all struggling with because there is no, there's no tried and true fast or, you know, kind of way for us to say, if this happens, then this happens. It just doesn't exist right now. We'd love to have that um, visibility. We just don't have it. Right. And I guess that's, 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 the, that's the challenge, right? Like we're red it now to so understand what you said, but it's hard, it's hard to kind of strive for green because when we're green, it's not like we're in school. So if we were at green tomorrow and everybody's back in school, I bet you, you know, the town would figure out a way to get the green real, real quick. So it's just, I, I guess it's just hard to understand how this decision is going to be made when the default is not to go back to school. It just seems like that is going to perpetually roll down the hill and continue um, unless we know what we're trying to achieve. 
I don't, you know, I think we all know that we want to be green, right? I think we all know that. I don't think that that's a secret, Andrew. Everybody knows that we'd love to be green right now. And we know that that's a target that if we were, if we mitigated the spread of this completely, we all go back. That's just not what happened, what's happening across the country. You know, the fact is that we're, we're you know, as I just said, 120,000 cases yesterday. We're heading in a bad direction. And I'm doing everything I can to keep our kids in school right now versus take them out. And I agree. But I just don't know why. I, I mean, I frankly don't know why the, the, the national caseload matters. But I guess my point is, yes, we all want to get to green. But if we got to green, I don't know what would change, right? Where red is the same as green right now. Oh, I think a lot would change. I think it's a lot easier, um, absolutely, to be thinking to, to bring your children more and having that conversation, real conversation about if we could stay in green and that's where we were looking, then absolutely we'd be talking about how we can bring our students in faster, um, more in person. There's no question about that. I mean, here I am, I, we're in red and I'm talking about bringing students in. Um, and so obviously that's a lot easier conversation um, with staff and with parents. Frankly, I also have some parents that don't want to do this too. Um, but, you know, you, you, it's, a, it's an easier conversation, no question. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, next up we have uh, Laura Donnelly. Uh, good morning, Dr. Austin. Um, good morning. Uh, given your, your position, and you seem to have your thumb more on the pulse than the rest of us do in terms of the state, can you give us an overview of what's going on at DESE and even on the budget level with the state? For example, is DESE going back and re-exploring any of the guidelines, in particular <clears throat> transportation. Um, and on the state level, I know the Ways and Means Committee, uh, subcommittee submitted the budget yesterday, their recommended budget yesterday. How's that looking on a state level? And then what's the trickle down effect to us in Hingham? So that's our, my first question. And my second question is, um, Ed Week had, I think it was Ed Week, had an article uh, this past week about um, how low teacher and administrative, um, including you, morale is. And could you speak a little bit to, yeah, could you uh, kind of tell us how things are going for you and your offices, but also maybe, you know, amongst our, our teaching staff, because I think that that does uh, tend to trickle down and amongst our, our, our kids too. Thanks. Wow, that's a great question, Laura. I could spend the rest of the time on that one. Um, and I thank you for asking for that. First of all, I'll talk about DESE. You know, um, the commissioner has done a great job of trying to communicate with us regularly. I have regular contact with him. He, um, for a state this size, now I came from Maine, and I think everybody knows that, um, and actually worked with uh, the person who became the commissioner. So it was very easy to get in touch with people. Here it's not so easy because we're a, obviously a state of 7 million people. Um, I, I will say that I've texted the commissioner and he's actually called me at home, which is just remarkable. Um, and, and so he's very accessible. Um, I, I think he understands um, what we're all up against out here and he's trying to give us the data that he can. Um, I, you know, there's no question he's working with He's working with a pediatric, um, whatever that um, organization that he does in the state, um, to look at the numbers on the buses. He is trying to look at the um, numbers of buses and to see if there's anything we can do to change that, um, to, to give us more access. Um, and, and to the, the metrics, he's also trying to give us some, some better metrics to be able to follow because he knows that we're all over the map. You know, what I use, and I mean, we're all kind of sitting out here by ourselves saying, okay, I'm red, what am I gonna do? When there's no metric to say, well, if you do this, then this happens. Everything seems to be subject to somebody's opinion and thought. And I, all I can do with that, to be honest, is I reach out to every single constituent I can find in the town to say, help me with this. You know, give me the context from where you are and, and how does that impact you? Um, so I, I think that's a positive thing. I'm, I'm looking forward to those, those metrics as many of us are, because um, we can do some help with that. Um, I, I, Budget-wise, the budget that I saw being put forward was a level-funded budget. We planned for in the austerity program that, that we um, agreed to with the town, um, we had planned on about a 19 or 20 percent um, cut um, to funding. That has not come to fruition. If it's level funding, uh, it's nowhere near that. Um, so that's a very positive thing. 
I would also say for the side of the town, the town has been incredibly, um, first of all, they, they gave us that $3 million bridge um, because we knew that that was a potential where the loss would come um, to make sure that we did not have any loss of, of positions or, or things that we absolutely need right now to survive. Um, and then on top of that, they've been very, um, very forthcoming with do what you need to do to, to get us through this fall. Um, you know, frankly, that's, that's the language that they're using. Do, spend what you got to spend and get us through this. To that end, you know, if we're going to look at, and somebody brought up remote teachers earlier, that's seven additional elementary teachers, seven additional elementary teachers, seven additional paraprofessionals, if I can find them. Um, you know, we are, when we're opening in Weymouth, we're going to be looking at another administrative assistant for that, looking for another nurse over there, looking for custodial staff. Um, all those things that we're putting in in the town is absolutely supporting us. And the fact that we didn't plan on renting a facility. Um, and, and so they've been incredibly helpful with that. So budget wise, I think we're doing okay. We're going to do just fine. Um, we have the support of that and we're waiting for COVID. We put, um, over a million dollars of reimbursable so far for COVID relief, um, monies from Plymouth County. Uh, and we do anticipate we'll get a majority of that back. Uh, and we'll have more, uh, more to go in so that we get closer to that two to $3 million level that we actually spent that we hopefully get in return. So budget this year, uh, I think is gonna land just fine. Um, I think next year is gonna be the trick. Um, we've already heard that already. We know what the demands are for, of what, I don't wanna say demands, what people are advocating for, the better word, um, because I'm advocating for the same things. If you recall my tier uh, you know, request last year, it's pretty much the same. Um, those are things that we absolutely need um, to move forward. And so that's what we're gonna do with the budget. Um, that said, I do anticipate um, some potential loss of revenue uh, because if the Commonwealth doesn't have the money to put into education, they either have to raise taxes and find it somewhere else um, or to fund us. Uh, so I don't know how that's going to play out, but I'm going to build a budget no matter what, regardless of what those, um, how that plays out in the end. We may not know, you know, frankly, when we get to April, when it's time to vote on a budget, how much revenue we actually have. Um, and that's very possible. Just like this year, we don't have a budget for this year. Here we are in November and still don't have a budget for this fiscal year. Uh, and so I think that's gonna be tricky. Um, now, the other, the other side of that, how's everybody doing morale wise? Um, I, I think, first of all, um, and I, I can't tell you how hard and how proud I am of the administrative staff. I'm going to say all of our staff. It's not just administrators. I'm going to just start with administrators for a minute. Um, your principals, your assistant principals, your directors, um, every 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 manager of a um, department have worked incredibly hard since March um, when we went into this um, crisis on March 13th. Um, they have given up all of their time. Their vacations were not spent, um, just like mine. Um, and when we did go on vacation, it was really only an alternative place for us to participate in Zoom, um, and, and we still work. Um, and I think um, every one of them have earned more than my respect um, for the type of work that they've done and how much commitment they have. Um, I am blessed um, to be where I am. I think the town is absolutely blessed um, to have them as administrative leadership, um, because there's no question in my mind how much they're dedicated to, to the children and to the families of this community. Um, and, you know, although they're tired, uh, I know they're tired. I know I'm tired. You can hear it in my voice. Um, there's no question about that. I lost it a long time ago, a couple months ago, and it's still gone. Um, we're tired. Um, and, you know, we, we get tried just like everybody else. Uh, our patience runs thin at times, particularly as things get said in the community that are very painful. Um, and, we are managing that and we are sticking together. Um, we are one incredible team uh, and we're gonna continue that way. Um, so yes, it's tough on morale, but I wouldn't wanna be with any other group than that group of people that we have. And I'll also say for our teaching staff, our educators, our paraprofessionals, our custodians, our kitchen workers, our transportation department, our technology department, you know, you, this town, I think sometimes, and, and unfortunately, I was on a call yesterday and I had a parent who just, you know, it was just one of those calls that I get once in a while that was telling me how much we had failed. 
uh, and it was because a teacher was on leave. Well, all kinds, I'm surprised, I'm shocked that we don't have more, given the, given the conditions that we have. And I think, you know, I even had somebody telling me they need to work on Saturdays. Teachers aren't working. They need to start working Saturdays. You know, and then what about Thanksgiving? I'm like, well, <laughs> you want us to come in on Thanksgiving now, all right? Um, but I, I think, as I said, they're tired, right? But I don't ever question their tenacity when it comes to serving the children they serve and how proud I am. I know that I, I probably don't even say it enough to them, right, of how proud I am of them, of every single person in this district that works their tail off every single day. Um, and excuse me for my, um, it, it's kind of an emotional thing for me because I'm so proud of them. Um, and, and I'm just blessed. I think we all are to what we have here. Um, this is just such a difficult time. This isn't just about teachers. It's not about bankers. It's not about, you know, it's every person that's being impacted that's had it right up to their eyeballs in COVID. Absolutely, we see it, um, but I think we're all trying to manage the best we can. And I'll, and I'll just reiterate what I've said before, we have to stick together now. This is not a time when Carrie Nee and I put that piece in the paper a few weeks ago on a crossroads, we're there. And we have to remember that. We have to remember we're on the same team. We're not, this is not team school versus the town. We're all in this together. We all have to figure a way forward and we all have to give each other that compassion that we absolutely need to be able to survive because we all have difficult times um, and it goes in waves, right? Sometimes it's hard for me, sometimes it's hard for you. Um, but this is where I think the strength of our community can be uh, and will be in the end. Uh, we'll come together and um, I just, you just have to feel my passion, I hope, uh, for what I do because I really do want us to come out of this incredibly stronger than what we ever came into it in the first place. Uh, and I'm dedicated to that. So thanks for the question. I hope that answers it to the best of my ability anyway. It did. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you, Laura, um, for those great questions. We have one, two, three, four more people. Um, their hands raised, so try to get through all of them. Um, I think I won't, after Heather just That'll be the last question because we'll probably go a little over the time clock. Um, so I will go to Holly. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, thank you, everyone, for all of your hard work. I appreciate it. Um, Holly, see you a lot. And I wanted to um, just ask a quick question. I have a 10th grader um, who has, uh, he's a special ed student, so we are very challenged right now, like everyone else, but um, especially challenged just um, because of um, the learning disabilities. And I know a lot of focus, as you've mentioned, has been with the um, early education students. And my concern is with the high school students um, and especially the older kids uh, and being on an IEP, having to take the MCAS. I know that, you know, this probably has to go to, you know, DESE, but I don't know how you guys anticipate the kids taking MCAS this year, how that's going to be, you know, factored into remote learning and, you know, having to pass high stakes testing, you know, if anything's been discussed about that. I know that they removed science as a requirement to get a high school diploma, but I know that English and math currently is still a requirement for 10th graders to receive a high school diploma. Yeah, um, well, first of all, uh, thank you for the question, Holly, and, and, and are you still there? I, you're not frozen, right? I'm here. Okay, I just wanna make sure, I'm sorry, you look frozen for a second. I just wanna make sure I, I didn't miss any part of your question. Um, yeah. I don't know which one to start with, the MCAS or IEP first. <laughs> I was like, I'll start with the IEP first. Um, first of all, I, I, you know, I, I think that, um, one, I know that Dr. Benz and I talk about this uh, often with our team and how much passion she has to make sure that we're doing the very best we can for our students on who are receiving services and how difficult that is right now on families. We're incredibly aware of that. 
Um, and, and so if there's a piece of special ed here, I'll, I'll certainly uh, acquiesce to, to Dr. Venice here in just a moment. But I, um, the second part is about a testing. I, I think we, we clearly are um, concerned about MCAS. Uh, there's no doubt that I'm very concerned about MCAS coming up this year. Um, I would just, I would hope, I would love to see, and we've advocated for this, that we actually not have them, um, because I think that's this is not the environment to do that in. Uh, and, and there are many kind of initiatives out there to kind of uh, ask that that not happen. Um, you know, the commissioner so far has been straightforward because the testing is required as part of that national, and that's been at Betsy DeVos uh, federal level that, um, you know, it was last year we got the waiver and then we'll have to wait. We're going to kind of, I think, like everybody in the world, let's talk about what the real elephant in the room is. We're all sitting here waiting what's really going to happen in our country. Um, and, and I think that's part of it, right? We have to wait to, to find out if there's going to be a change in the White House and how that impacts these kind of things. I think they'll have an impact. Um, and, and so we're just going to wait and see with that. But I'm concerned about that as well. I, I don't know if... Um, I, there's probably a bunch of administrators on here that would say the same thing um, that I would uh, in regards to our concern about MCAS and um, Katie, do you want to, you took off your mute, Katie, so I thought yeah. you might want to partially respond. Absolutely. Thank you for that question, Holly. Um, and just to clarify, um, for science in particular, our current grade nine students will in fact um, need an MCAS this year based on the current um, guidance. Uh, students in grades 10 to 12 uh, will need to pass one of the major uh, four uh, science courses, bio, chem, physics, or tech ed, um, in order to earn their science competency. Um, but our freshmen will, in fact, need to take a, a, a bio MCAT um, uh, in order to, to graduate based on the current uh, requirements. But um, just to kind of zoom out um, and just discuss kind of the curriculum, um, the directors have been working with teachers to identify power standards and so which which is uh, built into our curriculum guide and so our students will in fact have the background that they need um, to take an MCAS should that eventuality um, be fulfilled which is again the current guidance is that um, MCAS will be administered in the spring and we are confident that our students um, are progressing through a year's worth of curriculum and will in fact be prepared um, for the high stakes test. We are of the opinion we would prefer um, that the high stakes testing um, be um, removed for this year. Um, so again, that would be our, our certainly our recommendation if we uh, have any sway um, in terms of that. But in terms of the curriculum, students are on pace um, to um, meet the power standards um, that would be on an MCAS. And so from that standpoint, um, we're confident about the preparation. Again, hopeful that uh, the actual plan won't be executed, uh, but we are we are prepared as though um, students will be taking an MCAS, and the students are again making um, effective um, progress. Again, our goal for every student this year is a full year's worth of growth and progress and content. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Holly. Um, Next up is Linda Sharkansky. Hi, hi, hi everyone. Hi, Dr. Austin. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. So I just wanted to follow up to the gentleman's comment earlier about obviously the older kids getting back in. I know the focus is the K through two now and a lot of work obviously needs to be done to make that happen. Is it fair to say from an expectation perspective that the, the older kids won't go back in for the year? I mean, if you think about the insurmountable work that has to be done just for your endeavor in January and and that you haven't even thought about the other kids getting in more, is it reasonable to think that it just won't happen this year? I, I think there's two things. I think, and, and Libby, you know me well enough that I don't, I'm, I'm not ready to, to throw in the white towel yet on for the rest of the year. Um, the second part of that is I would say it's not that we haven't thought about that. Uh, absolutely, we think about that and we discuss it often. Um, I, I, I don't think it's fair to say, and I don't want to go on record for that, that this is a wash year and that's never going to happen. Um, I think that, you know, this is very fluid. Uh, we have conversation every week with our administrators uh, about how we move uh, in and out um, and how this could work. Um, you are right, you know, that the, and the issue about January for for, for elementary is, is also the fact that we have to get more space. 
um, that that creates a lot, and there's work that has to be done to get them up to speed on technology, et cetera. Um, and then really what takes probably the longest part of time is negotiating with the unions. Um, and so plans could be made, schedules can be done, uh, and then we'd have to negotiate. So I'm not ready to throw in that towel to say that we're done for the year. Uh, in fact, I'm going to remain hopeful that if we're able to do, we're able to do that. If, if conditions warrant, that we'd be able to do that. Uh, and that's an ongoing conversation. Um, so that's where I'll leave it. Is there any chance that we could reconsider the full days for the two days at the high school level? Um, I know the issue is lunch. One of the main issues is lunch, but it, but I did call a couple of other towns yesterday that are doing hybrid and they're in full days and they had very interesting lunch um, schedules that maybe Hingham could consider. I just think if they're in there now, why can't we extend the day and whatever barriers there are, could we put a task force on that to make that happen? Yeah, we're already in, you know, uh, when this is something that we constantly look at, we look at our schedules and how that impacts that day and what that would look like. Uh, because it would take a change to the schedule, and that's not insurmountable. Um, I, I think those are things that we're already in talks about, uh, so nothing's off the table. Uh, we will continue to work with our high school staff that uh, and our faculty to, to decide how best to, to move forward, but that's not off the table, and that's something we've been discussing for a while, uh, and hopefully the, uh, the metrics turn down to a point where we feel more comfortable putting people in for longer periods of time uh, and going forward. I would also caution all of us about you know, one of the things that I, I try very hard not to do is to compare us to uh, one or another. Um, because I think that, and this is a frustration part too, because if you go way back in, in probably April or May, we were told by Desi that we were all going to have one model to follow. Um, that everybody was going to come out and do the same thing because everybody was all over the place uh, in March and April and May in doing remote learning. And so we were, we were told that we were going to have you know, hopefully one or two models that we we're all going to be able to choose and that everybody would be doing the same thing. Well, that never materialized. And so now what we have is that every district does something just a little bit different. Um, and so, you know, we met, we, I know we're live for streaming more uh, at the, particularly at the secondary level than some of our, our neighbors are. That doesn't mean their program is bad. They're just doing it differently. Um, and um, so we're all, you know, we're, we're constantly looking at, and we do talk to our neighbors about what works well, particularly around things like lunch. Um, we try to learn from each other and figure out how we can move that forward. But um, just a, a quick, a, a long explanation to a short answer, I suppose. But um, this is something we're always putting on the table and we're always considering uh, and we're talking about. It. Thank will you. Will it be the metrics that push the needle to a definitive answer? Like, will it be the metrics and the space issues? Did yeah, I, I think those are the two major things, space and metrics, absolutely. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Linda. All right, uh, next up we have Jennifer Cottle. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is just around the plans to get K through two back in full time. And first, I just wanted to commend the creative thinking because I think this really kind of shows initiative with St. Jerome. So thank you for that. Um, I'm just wondering about the target date in January. It seems like we have all four elementary schools waiting for January because of foster space issues. Is there any consideration, I don't want to be the popular opinion with the foster parents, but getting Southeast and PRS in sooner as we kind of get St. Jerome's up and running? And, you know, I guess in terms of like, we need to be able to pivot quickly and you know, you talked a lot early on about having those two weeks in the beginning of the school year so that we could coach and train our teachers so that we could pivot from models quickly. And here we are trying to pivot and it seems like it's, it's still like a two month lag time. So how do we um, increase our ability to pivot quickly? And is there an option for the three other elementary schools? Yeah, I, I've not considered an option to put three elementary schools in and one out because I think that that's just horribly unfair if you're, if you're a foster parent or a student that you don't get um, what others do because of space. I think that's that's one. Two, it does, it's just going to take time. The bigger issue here, honestly, is not so much of um, even whether you get foster or ease. In fact, we have to negotiate a lot of these things. This is going to take time for us to get to an agreement on, on particularly those, those um, particularly one and two, because they're a much larger size. Um, we are working on kindergarten. 
um, and hopefully we might be able to do um, kindergarten faster. We're, gonna, we're, we're trying. Um, it's not a guarantee. I don't want people to think that that's a guarantee out there. We're just really working hard, um, particularly kindergarten because they're much smaller classes uh, and it's easier for us to get them in. I'm going to get um, for you, okay? Hold on. All right, somebody's not on mute. <laughs> yeah, um, and so, you know, it's just, I mean, the reality is, too, that there's only, I don't know, how many more weeks between now and, and the winter break? We've got, what, five weeks of school left, um, give or take. Um, so there's just not a lot of time to get that done um, between now and then, and just a lot of planning that has to be done through the negotiations process. Um, and we're going to we also have to have some probably some furniture differences, so we're going to need time to get our furniture in place, too. So we're working at it as fast as we can. We hear the families. We, we know what the concerns are. Where is concern? I will tell you, the the assistant superintendent, uh, Dr. LaBilwa, Dr. Venice, uh, Susan Nevado, our HR, and all our four principals at the elementary level have been weeking, uh, uh, meeting weekly to, to develop plans and work move forward. I know that they're working incredibly hard to try to get that as quickly as possible and make it as smooth and, and seamless as possible for all students. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, all right, it is a little after 10, but we have one more question, Dr. Austin, if you don't mind. I absolutely do not. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Heather Chisholm? Hi, Dr. Austin. Thanks for taking my question. Um, sure. Actually, I think you've kind of already answered it. Um, I just kind of want to reiterate with Linda, with Linda and uh, Liz Klein said. So I have um, three kids at all three levels, elementary, middle school, and high school. And actually, I was most worried about the elementary and middle school, but after you know being in this for several months it's the high school or the freshmen that i'm actually most concerned about um i know the complexity um and realistically i'm thinking that it might not happen of getting them back but i'm wondering what happened to the wednesdays could we possibly do something at the high school level for the wednesday yeah, I, I think, you know, as I say, what I, just to be clear with people, we, we, we know that that's an issue out there for people, and that's something that we are talking about every single week to administrator. We are looking at that as a potential for a, a change in the future, um, and so we are looking at all those issues. Um, you know, the Wednesday was initially, th th there's some really good things that happen on Wednesdays, too. It is a chance for, and particularly like at the high school level, where Wednesdays, it, you know, our, our time that everybody is exactly the same and, and, and it's brought together through, through remote means um, doesn't mean that we couldn't do it on a Wednesday. Um, I think we know we, we, we possibly could, um, but these are things that we're, we are talking about. So okay. I get it. We are, we are considering that. Great. I just, I just want to reiterate because I know the focus has been on K through two elementary. I totally agree with that. Um, but as a parent of a freshman, the transition has been incredibly difficult. And this yeah. is of a student who usually is quite independent. Um, and the 75 minute Zoom classes have the feedback that I'm getting, not only from my child, but from other parents, is that it's extremely frustrating and it's hard to focus. Um, teachers have um, expressed that they're seeing this in test scores. Um, so. Again, I know you guys are working incredibly hard, but if we can just, you know, not forget about this group as well, of just getting them a little bit more time in person would be great. Yeah, Heather, thank you, Heather. And you know, the one thing I want to say, look, the so that I don't give the wrong impression. Yeah, we we've talked about K two and moving them in full time, but that doesn't mean we're not looking at all of our K twelves, um, and that's something that we're we're very concerned about and and. Um, we, we're looking to do the very best we can for the experience of all of our students um, across the board. Um, that's really important. We, we hear you. Um, and again, I, I know that these administrators and these teachers are in, and our support staff are all incredibly dedicated to doing the very best we can um, to move us all forward and, and get a good experience out of this. Uh, and, and all of us sitting together making the very best out of a very bad situation. Um, and uh, I'm hopeful. Um, they give me hope, frankly, and, and I appreciate the question. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that's it, Michelle. Heather. That is it for the question. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, we have another one scheduled for next.
Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, and then we do have um, a calendar. We're going to do these, I think, pretty much monthly from now on. So um, look for more information on that. And thank you, everyone, um, parents, faculty, administrators. Thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Um, I'll take a motion to adjourn the okay. subcommittee. On the um, subcommittee. I second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Carrie? Make a motion to adjourn the full school committee. I'll second. Or I'll make a motion to adjourn. Sorry. A second. second. Thanks, Jen. Um, all right. Michelle? Aye. Jen? Aye. Yes. Aye. Eliza? I'm sure I'm done. I'm not. We are adjourned.